have Mia McReynolds with the University of Virginia. Um, okay, the title. talks titled Trophic Ecology of Burbit Variety. Burbit varies among basins of Lake, Lake Champlain. All right, thanks so much. And thanks everybody for coming to my talk. Um, so I'm Ian McReynolds. I'm a PhD student at the University of Vermont. Um, and I'd like to start just by shouting out my Burbit co-authors, Ben, Shira, Emily, Justin, Bianca, Jason, and Ellen, because this is obviously a team project. Um, and I'd like to thank the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife who really helped us with a ton of sample collection as well as the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and New York chapter of AFS for fun. So to start out, what are bourbon? <clears throat> well, they're a beautiful fish that's a member of the cod family. Um, so they're a cold water species with a circumpolar distribution of anywhere from one to three subspecies, depending on definitions that have changed over time. But you can see that they're widely distributed across North America, Asia, and Europe. They're found in all five of the Great Lakes, including down at the bottom of Lake Superior. But they're also found in cold water streams that are less than a meter deep. So we have this cold water fish that's widely distributed that occupies the greatest depth range of any freshwater fish species. As a species globally, vermin are not at risk of extinction, but locally, unfortunately, there are many populations that are threatened. And in the Great Lakes, those threats vary from historical, commercial fishing, um, construction of dams and impoundments that increase water temperature and decrease water quality. Um, sea lamprey predation has been a major impact, as well as alewife, which can consume pelagic larva. Um, but we don't see a lot of management that targets bourbon, um, partly because they're not a huge target of sport fishing, the exception of a bit of ice fishing. Um, but despite this, this lack of management interest, um, we have seen populations that bounced back in the Great Lakes. They crashed in the 60s, largely from sea lamprey combined with alewife. And we saw that following sea lamprey control and crashes in alewife populations, uh, vermin populations were actually quite resilient. But there's still a ton of uncertainty in terms of population size, uh, as well as food web interactions across the range. So we know that bourbon are a cold water piscivore, and obviously they can interact with other cold water species. If we think about lake trout, another native cold water piscivore, um, bourbon are part of the food web, uh, but these interactions can vary um, depending on population size, as well as depending on ecological context. So we saw that bourbon can be found in this huge range of environmental settings. So, I sought to answer some of these, these questions uh, in my local large lake, Lake Champlain, um, which is a long, skinny lake that borders New York, Vermont, and Quebec. Uh, and it naturally has a lot of sandbars and islands that divide the lake into smaller basins. But there are also more recently constructed causeways that seal off some of the basins nearly completely, especially for fish like burbot that don't often use these shallow water in the gaps. Um, so for today, I'm going to focus on the main lake basin and the inland sea, uh, two basins where vermin are, are found quite common. And these basins differ uh, in terms of physical structure as well as food web structure. So if we look on the bathymetric map on the left, you can see that the main lake holds significantly deeper water than the inland sea, um, as well as uh, the main lake is less productive. So the inland sea uh, gets a little bit warmer, more productive, and thus is subject to uh, bottom hypoxia in the summer. So we have an obvious difference in habitat suitability for cold water fish. We can also look at the structure of the food web. So starting in the inland sea, the food web structure is a lot simpler. You know, we have burbot uh, and their cold water uh, predator companions, the Atlantic salmon and walleye that are mostly feeding on a forage base of alewife and slimy sculpin, um, fueled by your kind of typical lower trophic levels in a lake. But in the main lake, we add some food web components. So starting at the top, we have a lot more lake trout um, that are feeding on a forage base that also includes rainbow smelt, along with alewife and sculpin. But we also have the presence of Mysis diluviana. So we have this large crustacean invertebrate that's a really valuable food source that can be consumed by both forage fish and by burbot, which we've seen in the Great Lakes. 
So our question here was, how do Burbit act as part of this cold water free web uh, in these two very different basins? And this project really had four main objectives. Um, just to try to fill in sort of this black box in the Champlain food web that is Burbit. Uh, and the first thing that we were curious about was population structure. So in these two basins, are populations um, well mixed or do they show genetic differences? Next, given differences in the forage base, we were curious if fish differed in length and age. You know, so are growth curves different given the presence of smelt and mysis in the main lake? And then finally, which is kind of the, the two pieces that I'm focusing on today, we examined uh, trophic ecology uh, using stomach contents to examine diet composition of fish and how that varied, and then stable isotopes to examine how Burbit used energy pathways, whether it's energy from the near shore or energy from offshore. And another objective was that this is really a side project, more of a pilot study, um, so we were using opportunistically collected samples um, there was already sampling going on targeting adult lake trout and juvenile lake trout uh, where we were catching tons of burbot that spurred some of the curiosity that really drove this project. Um, so almost a, a second objective was saying, you know, given these opportunistically collected samples, can we still detect these, uh, these effects that seem to be quite large in the literature? So in 2020 and 2021, um, we collected just over 160 fish by bottom trawling and gill netting, um, where for a subset of these fish, we have analyzed them with all four methods. So we have this really complete picture of at least 30 fish uh, in terms of diets, genetic signature, length of age, and trophic ecology. But to step you through the, the four methods that we used, uh, to examine population structure, we used a whole genome genetic approach uh, that Ben Marciquet led that was really able to let us dial into some of the finer scale variation in, in genomes. Uh, we used age estimation by otoliths plus biodata to compare length and age. Uh, we used stomach contents uh, converted into presence absence to study diet composition. And then finally, we used stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen to track energy flow. And the first thing that we found was that burbot are not a well-mixed population between the inland sea and the main lake. Uh, so it seems like those causeways plus the natural structure of Lake Champlain does reproductively isolate these two populations. And so here we have a, a biplot of some of the genetic variation where you can see that the inland sea fish show up as this orange cloud on the upper left compared to the main lake fish um, from the south, central, and north region, regions of the lake that are this kind of blue uh, cloud in the lower right. So obviously these, these basins are effectively uh, they're separate populations of Burbit. So the next thing that we saw was that these two groups of fish show very different uh, patterns in terms of length and age. Uh, so when we compare fish captured in the bottom trawl survey, uh, fish in the main lake appear to attain a much greater length and age, um, especially starting in ages 6 and 7. Uh, compared to the inland sea, where we can see fish that seem to reach almost a, a maximum length around 300 millimeters. And this difference is even more obvious uh, when we add in fish captured in the gill nets, uh, where we see fish that are a lot larger in the main lake. Um, and so there are two likely causes of this. The first one could be differences in habitat. Uh, like we talked about, the inland sea is a little bit warmer, and it can be subject to hypoxia in the summer. Um, this could also be due to differences in diet. So we saw those major differences in terms of food web structure and, and resources available to bourbon. So our follow-up question was, are these main lake fish larger because they're eating higher quality food? And we found that that is quite possible. So looking at the presence of stomach contents in, in uh, these bourbon, we saw that in the main lake, fish were consuming fish uh, and mysis most frequently compared to the inland sea where they were consuming primarily benthic invertebrates. And so we can see this really crisp uh, difference at a larger, coarser scale, as well as at a finer scale. So here I've just plotted the same thing, uh, diet composition based on stomach contents, but broken burbot up into 100 millimeter length bins. Um, so you can see the sample sizes above each bar. Obviously we had a little bit of a sample size limitation, especially at the smaller sizes. Um, but we can still see 
on average, uh, the diet diversity was much higher in the Inland Sea, um, and there was a lot of individual variation. But in the main lake, what's, what really strikes me is that even large fish uh, were eating a ton of mysis. You know, so this was one of our largest fish with a mix of sculpin and mysis in the stomach. So that's kind of interesting, and it kind of leads to this follow-up question. Uh, if bourbon are eating these benthic invertebrates, are they serving as a, you know, essentially an energy coupler of, uh, the, between the nearshore and the offshore environment? And that's a question that we can ans answer with stable isotopes. Um, so the first step here, uh, I'm going to build this from the bottom of the food web up, is to quantify your sources. So in the main lake, we do see a deep chlorophyll layer that sets up. And so I've captured that deep chlorophyll layer as hypolimnetic POM. Uh, as well as epilimnetic POM, which is just a surface graph. And those are our pelagic resources, which we can contrast with inshore production, uh, which was pretty much attached algae and macroalgae uh, from the photic zone. We don't see a deep chlorophyll layer in the inland sea, uh, so I've combined the epilimnetic and hypolimnetic particulate organic matter as that pelagic kind of phytoplankton base. But we do see, again, of course, the inshore kind of attached benthic algae. So then we can add our consumers, the bourbon on here. Um, so you can see the length ranges on the top, which did overlap. But again, in the main lake, we do see slightly larger fish that tend to have a slightly high, higher uh, nitrogen signature. And so using this data, um, I went into MixSire and created individual mixing models. So we were saying, you know, based on these uh, basal resources, as well as trophic enrichment factors in the literature, uh, what are the odds of bourbon using this inshore versus this pelagic energy? And what we saw was that there was a really strong reliance on pelagic resources in both basins. So in the main lake, you can see uh, over 75% of, uh, of uh, energy contributions to bourbon are likely from epilimnetic particulate organic material, that phytoplankton near the surface. And in the inland sea, we see that really strong pelagic signature. And so this might be kind of surprising, uh, because we just saw all those bugs in the bourbon stomachs from the Inland Sea. Um, but what we need to remember is that there is a bit of error in mixed sire, um, based on the trophic enrichment factors used, which I did pull from the literature as opposed to constructing specifically for bourbon in Lake Champlain. But there's also a difference in isotopes between consumption of items and actual assimilation into the muscle tissue. So it's possible that fish in the Inland Sea we're consuming, uh, you know, alewife and smelt, these forage fish, and those fish were actually leading the, the fish to grow, versus, you know, these benthic macroinvertebrates are mostly just keratin. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And the next step further uh, is to estimate trophic position. You know, so where, where in the food web are these fish feeding? Um, and what we do is use uh, baseline corrected isotopic signatures plus a known fractionation uh, to estimate that for each individual fish. And in the Inland Sea, uh, we saw that we were feeding at about a trophic level three, uh, which makes sense uh, because the food web is a little bit simpler like this, especially when we contrast it with the main lake, uh, where we have essentially an additional trophic step because there are mysis. You know, so we have this, this flow from your two basal resources to mysis, then to forage fish, then to bourbon. So the trophic position is interesting because it shows first that fish in the main lake are likely incorporating mysis into their diets, which is pretty clear uh, from the stomach contents. But this also just reflects food web structure, so it's another metric. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of our overarching bourbon project. Uh, so let me step you through some of the conclusions. Uh, first, we found that bourbon are not a well-mixed population between the inland sea and the main lake. So we did see genetic differentiation between those populations, which have really only been completely separated for 150 years. And then looking at the length at age and diet components of the project, we saw that bourbon in the main lake attain a greater length at age. Uh, they tend to consume mysis and fish more frequently, and they have a less diverse diet compared to the inland sea. In both basins, we saw strong reliance on pelagic resources, uh, which we'd expect for bourbon. And I thought something that was striking was that we saw large effects despite our kind of opportunistic sample collection. 
And so this just kind of paves the way that, yes, there's obviously some kind of ecological difference between these two uh, groups of vermin that could be explored in future work. So for example, what is the role of mice in the main lake? You know, we know they can be a critical food source for early life stages. Maybe they're doing the same for vermin. You know, they could be fueling uh, really strong growth at ages one and two that sets fish up for a, a, a higher growth trajectory. I'm also curious about winter movements and resource use. Vermin are really active under the ice when they're spawning. Um, they continue to forage, and so it'd be really interesting to see some winter sampling as well as acoustic telemetry. And so what we see here is that vermin are, are adaptable to fill this generalist cold water role across a very wide range of environments. The results I've found here really do fit in with what we've seen uh, in the Great Lakes and lakes across Canada. Uh, in terms of age growth and diet, and even the presence of this fine-scale genetic structure, which is really cool. And so I urge you just to think about how we can account for vermin moving forward in cold water fish management plans and surveys, just because we know they have population level impacts in the fish community, uh, as well as the fact that they're a good climate indicator. You know, they are at risk of uh, giving climate change, warming, and hypoxia. Uh, as well as interactions with other piscivores, sea lamprey, and forage fish. So again, thank you to everyone that helped with the project, and uh, especially the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, who uh, really helped us out in collecting samples. Uh, thanks to, uh, again, GLFC, New York AFS. And with that, I think I've uh, got about three minutes left for questions, but I'm, I'm really happy to chat about this more uh, during the break.